Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Empire of Japan on December 7, 1941. Japanese Americans were barred from military service and were classified as enemy aliens. Internment of Japanese Americans on the West Coast and Hawaii followed soon after. The U.S. government claimed that internment was for the safety of the Japanese, but many felt that it was motivated by racism. Volunteerism started in early 1942 with the Labor Battalion, the Varsity Victory Volunteers, or VVV, which was composed of Nisei men. They were to join the newly formed 442nd Regimental Combat Team at a later date. The 100th Battalion was formed in mid-1942 and sent to Camp McCoy in Wisconsin, then relocated to Camp Shelby in Mississippi. The 100th would eventually join 3,000 of the 442nd Volunteers from Hawaii. In the end, 14,000 Japanese Americans from the mainland and Hawaii would serve in the 442nd Regiment. The original group of volunteer recruits performed so well in training that the U.S. government reversed its decision to bar Japanese Americans from serving in the armed forces. There was a call for 1,500 volunteers from Hawaii and 3,000 from the mainland. 10,000 in Hawaii showed up in March 1943 to answer the call. After heavy training, various units were sent to Europe where they fought against daunting odds in Italy and France. The 100th Battalion of the 442nd was the first to see combat in Europe. They landed in Salerno, Italy in September 1943. Advancing to the north and encountering heavy enemy resistance, they suffered terrible losses, but fought bravely and established an outstanding reputation that helped pave the way for other Japanese American soldiers in combat. By June 1944, the remaining members of the 442nd were in Italy. They eventually made their way to Naples and Marseille in France, where they prepared for a trip to the Vosges Mountains, joining the 36th Division of the 7th Army. After intense fighting, the 442nd liberated the small town of Bruyere from German occupation. They went on to liberate Biffontaine, and though exhausted, the men were given orders to rescue at all costs the 36th Texas Division, which came to be known as the Lost Battalion, saving more than 200 men. By the end of three weeks in battle, half of the 442nd were either wounded or killed. The great sacrifices made by the 442nd Regimental Combat Team will live on forever, especially for Japanese Americans who owe special gratitude to them. Their heroic efforts combated not only the foreign enemy in Europe, but also the enemy of racism and discrimination here at home. Regimental colors are brought forward to receive the eighth presidential unit citation held by the 442nd. Nisai, hear President Truman's tribute. You fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice, and you won. The AJA, Americans of Japanese Ancestry Veterans, were given a hero's welcome when they began returning to Hawaii in 1946. Men of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, 100th Battalion, and MIS Military Intelligence Service remained a cohesive group. A clubhouse for the 442nd was built in McCulley and became a gathering place for war buddies.
The veterans themselves reflect those who contributed to Hawaii's post-war success story. The men, then in their prime, started new businesses or returned to family businesses started by their Issei first-generation parents. After the war, yeah, there were a lot of people whose families had started the business and um, now you have the, the sons coming back who've been exposed to everything the world has to offer instead of being just from Hawaii. They came back, the world was never going to be the same for them again. They were not going to go back to the plantation era. Because of their war experience, look, they had leadership ability, a lot more education, broad-mindedness, much more cosmopolitan in their world. They had a world view that went beyond the shores of Hawaii, so, uh, and they had ambition. I do know that I would never have the opportunity to be governor if not for what the members of the 100th and 442nd did. The AJA veterans fought a war for an equal and better society and returned to their family businesses, started new businesses, or found new careers. But they needed real and tangible power, politically and economically. On the surface, they seem to have erased racial prejudice, but there was still discrimination against the AJA, even in Hawaii. Uh, some of these men, and, and including my grandfather, had been corresponding with some of the uh, American and Japanese ancestry in the 442nd. And some of them were writing letters, and they were, they were in hospital beds in Italy. Uh, recovering from their injuries in the war. They're writing letters saying stuff like, okay, we risk our lives fighting for the United States, but what kind of Hawaii are we gonna come back to? Do we have to go back to the plantation? For most of us, it was inconceivable to go back to the plantation to do menial labor. As Sakai Takahashi told me in the hospital, he says, you know, we can't go back to that. We paid our dues, and so we decided to do something about it. It started in 1954 in the Democratic Political Revolution when the Democrats took over the state legislature, but it culminated in 1962 because 1962, when my grandfather became governor, um, he was then able to um, pass his agenda, which broke the Big Five's control over the state. Uh, I met Jack Burns for the first time, and Jack Burns started to ask me a lot of questions about my feelings for Hawaii. And it was on that, uh, after the, about 15 minutes, he told me to run for office. I first thought he was talking to uh, somebody else. I turned around to see, and then he said, no, you. With the encouragement of John Burns, Many returning veterans ran for territorial office and won by a landslide in the Democratic Revolution of 1954. Their ads were simple, rustic, and low cost, but effective. Then came the arduous trek to statehood. While a delegate from Hawaii to Congress in the 1950s, John Burns spent countless hours in lobbying conservative Democrats, and he swayed the powerful Texas delegation with the story of the heroic efforts by the 442nd to save the lost battalion from Texas. My grandfather did form a really good relationship with Lyndon Johnson, who was the president of the Senate when my grandfather was territorial delegate to Congress. And he also formed a good relationship with Sam Rayburn, who was the Speaker of the House of Representatives at that time. And Sam Rayburn was also from Texas. So um, my grandfather would often remind them, and he would remind even the whole Congress, of what the, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team had done in rescuing the Lost Battalion in 1944. Jack Burns did the best thing for Hawaii, I think. He really took it Orientals and other races. He was fantastic. 
One recent Army reservist and a former member of the 100th Battalion, 442nd Infantry, had read an account of what the Nisei soldiers had done in World War II and admires their accomplishments, especially the story of the rescue of the lost battalion from Texas. He recalls a chance encounter with a stranger while vacationing in Florida. But I had a polo shirt on, and the polo shirt had on the 442nd patch and a crest on, over here on the chest. And so I was walking around, there was an elder, elder uh, Caucasian gentleman. He was walking with a cane. And when he saw my polo shirt, he stopped. He, he changed the cane from his right hand to his left hand. And he got into the closest semblance of the position of attention that I guess he could at, you know, in his, in his condition. And he, and he looked at me and he saluted. And I, I was just, I was kind of shocked. I said, sir, what are you doing? He looked at me and goes, I'm a member of the Lost Battalion. And he goes, we made a promise that any time we see somebody from that unit, we'll salute them. And I looked at him and said, sir, with all due respect, I said, obviously I'm not one of those that rescued you. I'm not even a son or a grandson of one of those that rescued you. And he looked at me and goes, young man, no disrespect, but I'm not saluting you. I'm saluting what's on your chest. After the war, when we came back already, we felt that, hey, we were no longer second-class citizens. We were just as good as anybody else. It, it, this is why Danny Noe keeps saying, you know, Japanese and, you know, they, they said I'm an enemy, and now all of a sudden I can be the leader of my country. You know, that was amazing. After he graduated high school, he was working as a mechanics assistant at a gas station. So um, I guess if it hadn't been for the war, he often said that he might still be there. Um, if it wasn't for going off, you know, doing his duty, coming back and taking advantage of the GI Bill, um, he might still be working at that gas station today. Not enough can be said about the GI Bill of Rights, which was signed into law by President Franklin Roosevelt on June 22, 1944. The veterans reaped its benefits, continuing on with higher education, which set them on a solid path for their futures. If you look at the record, number one, we took advantage of the GI Bill in a like a flood, an avalanche. In my company, I think 95% of us did studies under the GI Bill. I went to law school as a result. You name all of Spock Matsunaga, Masato Doi, George Ariyoshi, these are all GI Bill of Rights. Those of us uh, who took advantage of the GI Bill, and I think most of us did, that made a huge difference in what we were able to do. Fujio Matsuda taught engineering at top academic institutions, then became director of the State Department of Transportation, UH president, and finally president of the Japan Institute of Management Sciences. Keiji Kawakami, who served in Italy and France, also took advantage of the GI Bill and attended New York University graduating with an MBA focused on marketing. He returned to Hawaii and started Iolani Sportswear in 1953. Jackson Morisawa, another 442nd vet, worked alongside Kawakami as his textile designer. I love my country. I'm proud of my country. As I said, you know, after the war, we came home the GI Bill of Rights. Oh, I went to the University of Hawaii. I ended up with a civil engineer's degree. Whoever came up with that idea, I think that was a very uh, beneficial thing because I look at it and today, I guess that was the best thing to the veterans. I went to University of Michigan and started the undergrad there and then went on to the uh, professional school, which is the law school of the University of Michigan. Coming back to Hawaii, uh, it was obvious that they now had much broader vision and aspirations, 
and given the opportunity to use the, the GI Bill, we're able to um, actually pursue an, a college education anywhere in the United States. Many went to the mainland, to as far away as Chicago and New York. Although they were well-educated, many of the returning veterans did not have assets nor immediate finances. Even John Burns, at one time, could not afford a home in Kalihi. Racial bars to home ownership in Manoa or Kahala, you know, and um, that reflected the society at the time. Um, opportunities were uh, very limited if you were not Caucasian, basically. Young lawyers, Elton Sakamoto and Sakai Takahashi, both returning vets, felt the need to create their own bank to help out the AJA and others who were struggling. Another key individual was Daniel Inoue. Meetings were held at Alamoana Park because, believe it or not, at the time, these soon-to-be-famous political figures could only afford plate lunches priced at about 50 cents. Thus began the establishment of Central Pacific Bank, which has grown to be a key player in Hawaii's banking community. The veterans were settled in their careers, and the longing for camaraderie led to gatherings at Club 100 and the 442nd Veterans Clubhouse, which led to fundraising. At times, King Street was even shut down for full-blown parades, replete with black Cadillac vehicles. I think from that time on, they knew that money-making was a very important activity. And when they acquired the Mo'ili Ili Young Men's Association Gymnasium, money making was certainly part of that. Before Liberty House was built, it was a swampland. And that's where the 442 would hold their carnivals. And back in those days, like in 1946-47, um, carnivals was a really big way of making money. So as I read in my dad's memories, the Club 100, who was already established here, invited them to come over and um, use the space here. But when it came time to talk about possibly joining up, there were certain conditions that they couldn't agree to, which was one, it had to be Club 100 and not the 442 Veterans Club. And secondly, they would have to pay back dues from And who could forget sumo in Hawaii, first brought here in the 1960s by promoter Ralph Yampuku and his war buddies. As Mariko Miho mentions, by hook or by crook, they figured out a way to get things done. The 442nd was also a sponsor of Maui sumo wrestler Jesse Kuhaulua, who competed as Takamiyama and made it to the rank of Sekiwake, sumo's third highest rank. My grandfather was a very big fan of sumo, so on the shortwave radio, they would often listen to the tournaments, you know, in that manner. And so um, what I read is that my father um, convinced the 442 to be a sponsor 
for the small tournament. ヨンヨンに女太平クラブと NTA パシフィックの主催で8年ぶりにハワイ場所が行われ客席は8年前と比べ半分以上は日系以外の観客でした8年ぶりにこちらで日本妻が行われることを私はとてもとても嬉しいことでございます10回の取り組みがあり高見山の星の数は4勝4敗また一般から霊を受け取るその大きな体は花で埋まりました My father would always say that in order to put on a sumo tournament, you really need an army. And so the 442 was a natural group, hook by crook. You know, they were able to pull it off. Speaking of large gatherings, a crowd of nearly 5,000 came out in droves for the premiere showing of the Hollywood movie Go for Broke. On May 4th, 1951. Fans, family, and friends lined the streets leading to Waikiki Theater to see the movie starring Van Johnson and some of Hawaii's own Nisei soldiers. It was a breakout moment for former actual soldiers. One of the vets turned actor, George Miki, played the part of Chick, a cynical katonk, a mainland born Japanese American. In 1952, I was transferred to Stevenson, and all these girls were asking me, Miki, Miki, are you related to George Miki? Because they all had a crush on him, because at that time, you know, he was only. Just turning 29 or 30. And they were, he was a Bobby Sox、uh, <laughs> idol for these girls. Guy gets into fight the Japs and winds up fighting with them. It's a hot one when you come to think of it. Oh, I don't know. A lot of us had parents who were born in enemy countries Italian Americans, German Americans. That's different, sir, and you know it. Why? Well, it's just. The shape、different. of their eyes? Or is it the color of their skin? What kind of troops are these? Chinese? Japanese. Didn't Hitler tell you? Japan surrendered and they're fighting on our side now. They all seem nice, you know, and friendly. More outgoing than the boys in Los Angeles. Boys in Los Angeles are more reserved, you know, unless they know you. So the Hawaii bunch was a fun. A fun, a lot of fun. <laughs> and then they had Ken Okamoto, who was, you know, always funny and joking. Tell me something, Sam. What does Bakatari mean? <laughs> well, freely translated, you're a heel. A stupid jerk and a heel. That was putting it mildly. Good day! George Miki died in 1960 at the age of 39, succumbing to cancer. Daughter Leslie did not see the Go for Broke movie, but has these memories. I remember he used to like to whistle、um, army tunes,、um, doo -doo, doo -doo 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 -doo, <laughs> that one. And I, would, I remember being in diapers and marching around. I order the Secretary of War, in the name of the President of the United States, as public evidence of deserved honor and distinction, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team is cited for outstanding accomplishment in combat. The gallantry and esprit de corps displayed by their officers and men in bitter action against a formidable enemy exemplify the finest traditions. Of the armed forces of the United States.
The 100th Battalion was formed in June 1942, and the men were shipped out of Hawaii to Camp McCoy in Wisconsin without much fanfare. The 100th, their hard work and good soldiering helped build the case was another argument in favor of, hey, maybe these guys can be trusted. These, yeah, let's, we need more, more soldiers, so let, let's create a larger unit. The 100 came first. They were actually draftees in 1940, before the war, and they were the first unit, um, NISA unit, to fight in World War II. Uh, because of what they did and because of how they uh, acted and performed. That's part of the reason why the 442nd was uh, formed. Very important to note that if any of the 100th Battalion Nisei had, had done something disloyal or even said anything disloyal and it had gotten back to the chain of command, it's likely the 442nd would not have been authorized. They were loyal and they served with honor and were committed, even though there was, they faced discrimination. Serve the country because they were fighting for a future that they believed in, a future that was to come. And I think it's so inspiring to have that kind of hope. You know, that many people, I wonder today, would have that same kind of, of attitude when you know you're being discriminated against because of what you look like and your background. Well, now the Army intended for the 100 to become part of the 442nd at some point in time because they left that space open in the first, for the 1st Battalion. There was no 1st Battalion. It was 2nd and 3rd and the, the space open. So when the 100th would join them, they would become the 1st the, uh, the Battalion. Uh, but by, by the time they did join, which was about summer of 1944, the 100th had already established a, a, a combat record, a notable combat record, so the Army had let them keep the designation of 100th Battalion. They needed obviously more people, so the plan was, I think, to get two-thirds of the volunteers from the internment camps and one-third from Hawaii, which was, you know, pretty stupid, right? I mean. You locked my family up and now you're giving me a chance to volunteer. Gosh, let me think about that. So you had almost 10,000 guys volunteered in Hawaii. Response to the call on the mainland was, I think, 1,100. Okay. Out of the 10,000 here, they took, what, 2,600. Perhaps because of their age and maturity, the men of the 100th began putting away $2 a month into a savings account, which started during their time at Camp McCoy. They wanted to have a place to come back to, to talk story, celebrate weddings, anniversaries, and special occasions. So they were very forward thinking, and they decided to form the Club 100 and to put away $2 out of each paycheck every month and from the beginning, from training to the end of the war, and they came up with uh, $50,000. Lots of people take credit for that. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I think the, the general uh, story is that one of the officers made a suggestion that, you know, you boys need some place to stay at the end. Uh, because of the way they were, yeah, they were such a tight-knit group. So that's how it started, and amazingly, somebody kept track of it the whole time and, and got the money home. Yeah, I did the math on it, <laughs> and uh, through in inflation only, that would be like a quarter of a million dollars uh, in today's money. So it was quite a bit of money. You think $2 is nothing, but um, added up, being that this was 1940, uh, in the 40s, uh, that money was worth a lot of money. It, it was worth a lot.
Today, volunteers from the United States Army Reserve come to clean and upkeep the 100th grounds and clubhouse every month. The volunteering started almost 10 years ago by Command Sergeant Major Bo Tatsumura, who had formed a relationship with both the 100th and the 442nd. I signed up, we, we all go through this place, the military entrance processing station, which is at Pearl Harbor, um, and we get our orders, and it said 100th Battalion, 442nd Infantry Regiment. Um, I, I didn't even know what that meant. You know, it, to me, it was an acronym on a paper. Um, so very embarrassing for me, also being Japanese, being from Hawaii. Um, I'm a fourth generation, but that's not an excuse. Um, but it wasn't until I got to the 100th that, you know, I, I looked up their history and I'm like, wow, this is, you know, a really historically great unit. Um, and it's still a great unit today. But uh, I think for most of us, the purpose that we're here and we do this is to honor them, uh, preserve their legacy. I mean, really, this is kind of their holy ground. Uh, and we want to see, make, make sure that it's taken care of. Been helping the veterans for a very long time, uh, me right. and uh, these guys in here, but right. yeah, taking care of the clubhouse and make sure it's taken care of every month. I think that many of them can, if they understand the individual stories, if they hear and are educated, and they know what they have done. And it not just in a generic way. When we look at a portion of the millennials and the generation Z today who have risen their right hand to say that I'll join and volunteer, because it's all a volunteer force today after 18 years of conflict, those people who are still a small percentage, but still, they still do it, they volunteer, are definitely inspired by the stories of the 10442. A young Hawaii student, 15-year-old Heather Dinman, is intrigued by the histories of the Nisei soldiers and World War II. In 2017, she won a gold medal in the Junior Website Division at the Hawaii State History Day Fair for her entry on the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. In 2018, she qualified to compete on the national level at National History Day in Washington, D.C and placed 25th for her website on Fred Korematsu, a civil rights activist. So Fred Korematsu was a Japanese American who actually stood against the internment and refused to compromise his civil rights by not reporting to the assembly center. So he stands for the many Japanese Americans who were wrongfully interned, including my great-grandfather, Joichi Tahara. I was interested in the veterans because my two great uncles actually fought in the 100th Infantry and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. My uncle Nash Tadayuki Tahara fought in the 100th Infantry Battalion, and my uncle Fat Yoshiyuki Tahara fought with the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, so that's what stemmed my interest, as well as knowing how they fought so bravely and loyally for their country, even though the USA was wrongfully interning Japanese Americans who didn't commit any act of sabotage and espionage. Another version of a 442nd movie was produced in 2018 by Hawaii filmmaker Stacy Hayashi after years of research on the background on the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Go For Broke, an origin story, dramatizes what transpired before, during, and after the Pearl Harbor attack on December 7, 1941. <laughs> To see everything finally come together, you know, because this has been her dream and her passion for so many years, and uh, and to see it all come together tonight, I mean, I just, you, you, I got all emotional. It's like, oh man, you know, and then uh, just there's just so many people.
Excuse me, sir. I'm supposed to be on that truck. My name is Inoy with an I. I should be on that list. Inoy with an I. Inoy, sorry, you're not here. There must be some mistake. We have so much talent right here in Hawaii, and I think this film really showcases that. You know, it kind of shows uh, shows people like what what we can do here. I mean, such a minimal budget, you know, but the community supporting this, you know, uh, and what they have, what what Stacy and her team have accomplished. I mean, it's just incredible. When I read the sides, it really moved me and to know, because I, I know a little bit about the history before the movie about the 442nd and who they are and what they meant, you know what I mean, fighting for our freedom, Japanese Americans, it's just, I knew the magnitude of it, I was, I knew like, I wanted to be a part of it, man, as soon as I read it. Look at our boys. Isn't that something, huh? It's so important that this movie is respectful to the memory of the 442 veterans and the original 100th and MIS as well. You know, for us, um, especially Stacy, as she's been working on this for so long. So for, for me, it was really just translating her words onto screen and just trusting her that it would all work out. Um, since she was really, you know, with them all the time and learning, learning from them and listening to their stories. So for me, it was easy. With few exceptions, cast and crew were from Hawaii, and some of the real-life legends of the era attended the film's premiere at the Hawaii Theater. To survive this epic battle, I know it's still painful to... I'm so glad that this has happened, because I've always felt that they needed uh, to be historical factors uh, to immortalize the 142nd and how they trained and and uh, went to war and became the most highly decorated uh, unit in the military in the history of the United States of America. When I was growing up, I had to go to school on the mainland, and these stories are not told on the mainland. You don't hear it. They're, you know, it, we take it for granted here in Hawaii. This is part of our cultural DNA here. But we need to have that kind of awareness elsewhere in the United States, because once you get onto the mainland and the further east you go, it's, you know, people just don't know these stories. And I think it's very important that this story is told in as many ways possible, as many times as possible. It's that important. I regret to tell you that you're all being dismissed. You're to truck back to Schofield tomorrow for an honorable discharge. The Army has declared Japanese 4C, or enemy aliens not eligible for service in military combat. All of you of Japanese ancestry are dismissed. Japan actor Bon Daisuke, well known in Hawaii for his role as the iconic Japanese TV superhero Kikaida, played the part of Issei entrepreneur Matsujiro Otani, father of 442nd veteran Akira Otani. First, we talk to Otani himself. Oh, that's kind of embarrassing, but... Uh... At least uh, the the people got to know what our our parents did to bring us up, and, you know, to place us in the kind of position that we are today. We appreciate very much what our parents did to us. 
Can you just tell me wh why you're taking him? What's going on? もう全くこの作品入るにあたってその辺のことは事情はわからないんで、まあ、自分が<笑>まあ正直なところ昭和22年1947年の生まれなんで、えー、ちょうどまあ戦時中の一番大変な時だったんですけど、まあ、その頃が話なんでね多分あの自分もこういうことがあったというハワイの方で。この辺のことは歴史としても日本でもちょっと勉強してないんですよねだからあの詳しい話を知らなかったんで、まあ、この話を見てびっくりしたんですけど日本でやっぱりこういう勉強というかやっぱり歴史の教科書に載せてもいいぐらいな僕は話だと思うんですが、うん、ちょっとその辺がねなぜこの話載せなかったのかなっていうところが。うん、もったいない話だなと思いますね日本人にとってはですね素晴らしい話なんで家族とみんなでわしの魚市場の海底を祝っとったんじゃこれを切ろうありがとうございます元気だなストーリー。But I think that the 10442 and all Nisei veterans understood that so very well. They knew the burden they were carrying on their shoulder. And not only to prove their loyalty for their family, their community, but I, as I mentioned, I really believe they were doing it for future generations. Slowly and steadily, restaurants, supermarkets, a countless number of bakeries, and other small to large size businesses emerged with the 442nd, 100th, and MIS veterans at the helm. They also became educators, prolific writers, healthcare professionals, and excelled in many other fields. Especially in Hawaii, when you consider the fact that in one generation, one lifetime, 
considering some of our World War II veterans who are still with us today, they have seen a tremendous change in Hawaii. So Hawaii was transformed. If the word is transformation, Hawaii was transformed because of their experience. And yet they stood up and it generated something I don't think we could have anticipated or no one anticipated. It was an amazing movement of strength and courage and everyone, communities, families, and our Nisei veterans uh, bonding together uh, to fight tyranny and injustice and then later on, you know, really uh, show that this is the American spirit. And I think it built the trust and confidence and really changed Hawaii. We went to Schofield, yeah? Then the government saw, wow, these people, they want to prove themselves. And that's how they formed the 442. Naturally, we all volunteered. What inspired you to join 442? Oh, okay. One second, is that okay? To prove that we are Americans. Well, to me, we should all feel proud of ourselves. We all we went through with the treatment we were getting. I think we did a pretty good job. I was fortunate because I was one of the first up. Uh, member to go to work at Pearl Harbor as apprentice because prior to our time there weren't any Japanese in Pearl Harbor working so that we were very fortunate to work for the shipyard. Listen to your parents more. This, this modern age I think they too much TV. You know? <laughs> they don't listen to the parents. They, don't, they have mind of their own anyway. As I said we grew up in a great, great country. The country was doubtful of Japanese, and we took every opportunity to prove our loyalty. And as you know, we lost a lot of good men, but we, some of us, who came back and served the country as, you can say, useful citizens. And, uh, and our family, Again, a loyal citizens. We are proud of our country. The Sansei and those that followed were given opportunities and live good lives today. And their sons, daughters, and grandchildren have taken full advantage of those opportunities provided by these brave men. It is not an exaggeration to say that we owe this life to those who fought not only against the enemy in World War II, but challenged discrimination and suspicion at home. All of us are the beneficiaries and are so fortunate that these Nisei soldiers of World War II had the guts and determination to dream big.